Our passage today is from John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. If you'll read along with me. Then each went to his own home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman called an adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to ride on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Then again he stooped down and rode on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Let's have a word of prayer. Precious Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, there are such riches that we can glean from them. They have such a depth that it stirs our soul and spirit, and yet, Lord, they are so clear that children understand them. Father, we ask that you'd make your word clear for us today and that we would catch a glimpse of you that may inspire us anew that may call us to a deeper walk with you or perhaps even call us to trust in you with our soul, spirit, and body. We do thank you for Jesus Christ and it's in his name we pray. Amen. I don't know how much you've thought about it. A question's often asked. Sometimes it's asked of pastors maybe more than others. What's your favorite scripture? And that's a hard question to answer. There are so many good, wonderful scriptures in there. And John 3.16 is one a lot of people bring to mind about God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that's a great one. This may be actually my favorite passage because it really gives me, and I think, pictures who Jesus is so well. Let's unpack this a little bit today as we look at the story. I'm sure you've heard before. We're going to listen to it again. But, you know, when we think about it, apparently there was no question of the guilt of the person that was brought before Jesus. She didn't deny it. Jesus didn't deny it. He acknowledged it. And certainly the the men that brought her did, although they're, they were suspect. So there's really no question that uh, one of the law, the Ten Commandments, was broken here. And that kind of tells us how important it is with God because he included it in those first Ten Commandments that Moses was given. And the law and the scribes, whose job it was to see that people tended to the law, had found out about the situation, and who knows, they may have set it up. They may have acted in order to trap Jesus, and they, they may have willingly, who, perhaps one of their own was the man that was caught with her, and both of them, of course, should have been brought to justice. So that's kind of our first inkling of the injustice taking place here. So definitely was breaking the law, of Moses, definitely was caught dead to rights. No one's denying it. And so they they brought her here. And and Jesus, you know, those men had no right to judge her, to condemn her, no right to stone her. And I I think Jesus was playing that out when he, he said, 
If you're without sin, if you're perfect, then you start the stone throwing. And it's interesting how it says one by one they started uh, drifting away. They knew they were not without sin. So Jesus in saying that says, if we take kind of the antithesis thought there, that the one who can condemn, the one who can stone her, is justified in stoning her, is the person that's perfect. That one who has not sinned would be the one to throw that first stone. And who is that person? Well, none other than Jesus himself. If anybody had the right to uh, enact the law against this woman, it was him. And yet he refuses to. They were trying to catch him because he was teaching new things. He was teaching uh, expanded. You know, Jesus said, I've not come to eliminate the law, but to fulfill it. And I've struggled with that question for a long time. And I, and I do think some have misinterpreted it to mean that the Old Testament law doesn't count anymore, doesn't matter, and I, I don't believe that's it. If you study Jesus' words on several of the Old Testament laws, he goes beyond. He takes them further than was said. And, and let's take adultery for example. The Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And later in the teachings, it gives this, this punishment for adultery. But later, another time, Jesus was teaching, and he quoted that verse, uh, how Moses has said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But then Jesus takes it further, and he says, But I tell you, if you have lusted in your heart, Lust be an inordinate desire beyond what is, is correct. If you have had that attitude in your heart, you are guilty of adultery. You see, he took a very practical, real action, and Jesus didn't say that no longer applies. He said, rather, there's a deeper meaning to it. And if you look through Jesus' teachings time and again, Jesus, Jesus said, he talked about thou shalt not commit murder. Jesus goes, but I tell you, if you have hate in your heart towards another, you have committed murder. Once again, Jesus takes a very definite physical act, murdering somebody, causing their death, and death through, uh, through uh, heinous ways, uh, 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 coming against them, attacking them, hating them. But Jesus says, but if you hate them, then you've committed murder. Once again, he takes that act and he expands it. And so as we see Jesus teaching, we see him doing that over and over. He did it even more with the tithe. He goes on and, and he talks about not only giving to God what belongs to God. He says, pay Caesar, the part we really don't like, give the government their due. But he also talks about offerings beyond that. And Jesus digs into that teaching when he talks about the widow with the lost might, how she only had the ten, and when one was lost, she searched for it until it was found, and so she could give it and have it. Jesus regularly talks about going on, and so this situation here, he, he, had, the, uh, he had the right, the privilege to be condemning of her. He alone could do that. She was caught dead to rights. There was no question about it, but yet... He refuses to do it. And the, the Jews were wanting to capture him there. They thought they could trick him. But of course you can't trick or fool Jesus. He turns it back on them. But, you know, somebody could take a very legalistic view. And they could, they could make that accusation of Jesus. Wait a minute. God gave the law and Jesus didn't uphold it. 
God said that's what's to be done, and Jesus didn't do it. Throughout the Bible, again, if you'll read with a discerning heart, you'll discover while God's law is true and he means it, there is a deeper meaning that he's getting to. Here, Jesus, one of the reasons that he didn't go ahead is because he knew this woman's situation. He knew it was not a just accusation. First thing, both of them weren't brought. The, The Bible doesn't say stone the woman, let the man go free. Both caught in adultery are supposed to receive the stoning. So that was a a big red flag right off the bat. And then Jesus, of course, knew the heart of the people bringing her, and, and he knew they were trying to trap him, that she was just a pawn in their game. He knew that they were being very unjust towards her, and I'm sure they treated her very badly, like the scum of the earth, and just uh, with great hatred. Jesus knew the situation, and so he was not going to, to oblige them by saying, yes, stone her. He forgave her. As he challenged them with that saying, if you're perfect, if you haven't sinned, you cast the stone. And they all drift off. The woman stays there. It's kind of interesting she didn't drift away. I mean, you'd think that would be an opportunity for her to leave, but she doesn't. Jesus looks up and says, where are your accusers? And she says, there are none, Lord. They had all left. And then Jesus says that wonderful word, neither do I condemn you. Again, as we study the word, there's a difference between condemnation and judgment. Condemnation bears with it a capital penalty. They wanted her condemned to death. Judgment is discerning right and wrong. And the words are similar and they kind of overlap, but sometimes we take that to think we aren't supposed to judge, and that's not right. We're not supposed to condemn, but we are supposed to discern right from wrong, and even in another person. We don't condemn them. We don't have the right or the power to to determine the outcome of their soul, which is condemnation. And so Jesus here, who did have that right, says, I don't condemn you. But he did judge her actions because he goes on to say, go now and leave your life of sin. He acknowledged that it was sin. He acknowledged that it was not uh, in keeping with the standard of God. He acknowledged that she needed to quit doing that. And of course, Jesus and his omniscience may have known more of her story about why she had gone into this life. Regardless, he, he considered her situation and he showed mercy and forgiveness. But he didn't condone her actions. He didn't enable her. He didn't empower her to keep on. He didn't say, you're, I'm okay, you're okay, do what you want to do. He said, I'm not condemning you. And parenthetically, though you deserve it, but don't do it anymore. Quit doing that. And the indications we have is that she did stop and she became a follower of Jesus. Uh, and we, we, she believes she is one of the Marys that then followed Jesus after that time. Her life was changed because of his forgiveness. You know, the wonderful story, the wonderful part about this story that we can apply today is Jesus knows your situation too. None of us are pure without sin. We strive, hopefully, each day to live for Christ, to set aside those things, but now we've got a sin nature. It's been 
covered by the blood of the Lamb. It's forgiven. We have the Holy Spirit within us, empowering us how to live. But we still manage to find our own way and do our own thing. And Jesus doesn't condemn us either. either. He does reprove us. He does say, don't do that. You know, it's like going to the doctor. It hurts when I do that. This doctor, and the doctor says, well, don't do that. Jesus says, don't continue to sin. Give it to me. Confess your sins. Uh, we are told in James, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us out your sins, our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus points out that we fall short of the mark But just as this woman here in loving kindness, forgiveness, mercy, and grace that we've been singing about, he says, I forgive you. Repent from that. Repent is going in one direction and going in the other. It's heading towards a sin. It's surrendering that to Jesus and actually moving the other way, trying to live. It's not staying in that sin just because you've gotten forgiveness. Repentance is changing that. And so that's what Jesus does, and he understands your situation. As humans, different things drive us to different actions. Perhaps someone has truly done us wrong, has truly betrayed us, or or has has manipulated situations to their benefit over us. And we, in a human sense, are justified in being angry. And perhaps everyone would understand us finding vengeance for something. But as Christians, we're encouraged to love our enemies. As hard as that is. Jesus said hard stuff. Sweet guy, forgiving, graceful. But he said hard stuff, and that's one there. But we do that because we trust him with what happens. We trust him to work in that other person's life if Jesus so chooses. That's not our business. Our business is to live for God, to live for Christ as he would have us live and leave all that other stuff behind, whether he chooses to do anything about it or not. That's not our job to condemn or to seek vengeance. Our job is to trust and do as Jesus tells us to do. It's, it's like that moment when, when John is, Jesus is called John, and John's going along with him, and he turns and says, well, what about him? And Jesus says, that's not for you to be concerned with. Jesus deals with us individually. He knows our situation. He knows He knows what we've come from, what we've come out of. He knows the dynamics impacting us. And the Bible teaches that. There's a great Proverbs book, verse in the book of Proverbs that says, if we should catch somebody stealing bread to feed their family, We understand, and we may show mercy. They've still committed a crime and need to pay the penalty of that crime, but we understand their motives. God understands what's driving us. He doesn't say it's okay for you to act out. He says, I've provided you forgiveness. I've provided you mercy. I've provided you grace, and I've provided you strength through the Holy Spirit to live differently. So like this person here called an adultery, each of us are at the throne of Christ every day with things to be condemned for. The wages of sin is death, and it doesn't pick out what sin. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. We have his forgiveness, and we can praise him for that as I've, I've tried to do through the songs today. So today my message to you, my encouragement to you is using this scripture to say to you, God knows your situation. 
He knows your loss, your struggle. He knows what you're going through better than anyone here. If it's a sin, if there's something standing in the way, hindering his work in your life, he's already forgiven it. It's covered by the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross for you. He's paid the penalty of death for you. He's provided the comforter of the Holy Spirit to give you strength, power, and wisdom to overcome those natures. God also understands those things where you're innocent, but you've been wronged, and he will work on your behalf. For we know all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God is working on your behalf, wants to work on your behalf, has worked on your behalf, is working on your behalf. The only thing stopping him from working is you. Through unbelief, through stubbornness, through a hard heart, we quench him off and we don't allow him to do what he wants to do. But he stands waiting. He stands willing. He stands wanting to bless you abundantly. And so today I encourage you to trust him in that, to believe his word. These aren't just stories uh, of, a, of a myth or uh, bedtime stories. They, they do make us feel good. They are enjoyable to read, but they're more. They're teaching us God's faithfulness and encouraging us to be faithful to him. Let's stand in prayer, please.